Okay, everybody can hear me, yes? I know there were issues earlier today. Everybody can hear me good, yes? All right. Um, first, just thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be at, at this conference with everybody today. And just to speak briefly about my research in the intersection of race and nuclear weapons uh, in the book. First, I just want to explain how this whole project got started. Uh, for most of my life as an activist and as an academic, it revolved around civil rights issues and the black freedom movement. That's what I studied, that's what I worked on. Nuclear weapons, like many young people, wasn't really on my radar at all. I didn't think anybody would be crazy enough to use them. And in 2005, I made my first trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And meeting with the atomic bomb survivors and seeing everything that was there, um, I was filled with guilt and rage and disgust. And when I came back, I realized I needed to put these two issues together. How do I eliminate nuclear weapons and how do I eliminate racism? And so starting this project, I, I went with one basic question. What did African Americans think about dropping the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And when I pitched this idea, most colleagues said, you're not going to find much because African Americans were too busy trying to gain their own freedom and equality. They didn't have time to worry about this issue of nuclear weapons. Uh, but they were wrong. In June of 1964, a group of Hiroshima survivors were on a world peace study mission. And the Japanese-American activist Yuri Kachiyama is the one who organized their visit to the United States. And when they came here, she said, what is it that you want to do most while you're in the United States? And they all said the same thing, meet Malcolm X. But Malcolm at the time was in the Middle East and in Africa traveling. And so she had sent letters to him because she was friends with him and didn't think that he even got any of them. But the last day that the survivors were here, she had a reception at her, uh, at her apartment and there was a knock at the door. And when she answered the door, there stood Malcolm. And Malcolm sat with the survivors of the bomb and he said, you have been scarred by the atomic bomb, but we've also been hit by a bomb and the bomb that hit us was racism. And he spent the day with them talking to them about Vietnam and nuclear weapons and racism and how colonialism and all these things were connected. Because Malcolm understood what so many before him understood, that the issue wasn't about civil rights, it was about universal human rights. So my book, my research focuses on those black activists who consistently argued that colonialism, the fight for freedom in the United States, and nuclear disarmament were inextricably linked. Now, when we dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in August 6, 1945, most of the American public rejoiced. In fact, Gallup ran a poll a week after the atomic bombing said that 85% of the American public agreed with Truman's decision to use nuclear weapons. In fact, Roper did a poll a week later that showed that 22% of the American public wished that Japan hadn't surrendered so he could have dropped more nuclear weapons and killed more people. And in fact, no poll up until late October of 1945 ever showed more than 4.5% of the American people criticizing Truman's decision. But in addition to the scientists and the religious community, in the black community, overwhelmingly they were coming out, musicians, artists, poets, journalists, uh, actors, to protest Truman's decision to use nuclear weapons. And of course it wasn't monolithic, it was for various reasons. Um, and so, when I started doing this research, I of course went to the black press, the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, Baltimore Afro-American, and beyond just the columnists criticizing Truman's decision, I wanted to know what rank and file people in the community thought. So I started going through all the letters to the editor, day after day, month after month, and it didn't matter if it was a beauty shop owner or a truck driver, they were all saying the same thing. They were critical of Truman's decision. I went through the sermons uh, of black pastors at that time. It was a very apocalyptic narrative, stating we don't have enough religion to stop this genie that was already out of the bottle. But the first person to really come out and, and challenge and question Truman's own racism in this decision was Langston Hughes. And of course he was right to do so. Uh, Truman wasn't the most racist president we've ever had. We probably have that now. Uh, but certainly one of the most racist presidents in our history. This is a man who, if you go through his diaries or his letters to his wife, he rarely ever refers to African Americans as something other than the N-word. This is a man who, when he was in Missouri, sent a $10 check to the Ku Klux Klan to become a member, and they sent it back to him because he refused to fire Catholic workers. He used to brag in interviews that, uh, in his family, you got out slaves as a wedding present, uh, as a gift to start out the housekeeping with. And when his mother visited him at the White House, she openly supported the Confederacy and said she'd rather sleep on the floor than ever step foot in Lincoln's bedroom. So we don't know how much, but certainly a part of his racism played a role in his decision. And I found a letter from Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Langston Hughes' friend, who was very apolitical throughout her career, in which she refers to Truman as, quote, the butcher of Asia. 
and is visibly upset that more in her community are not fighting back against nuclear weapons. But of the original protesting that I found in the black community, uh, the most far-reaching came from the black popular front, most notably the great W.E.B. Du Bois and the great Paul Robeson. Uh, du Bois likened Truman to Hitler, calling him one of the greatest killers of our day, said that what we had done in Hiroshima would set back the progress of, of colored nations for decades to come. And a year later, there was a, a, a rally in Madison Square Garden. 20,000 people were there about this issue. And Paul Robeson immediately went after the colonialism issue, asking the crowd, where do you think we're getting the uranium to build nuclear weapons? And the answer, of course, was the Belgian-controlled Congo. But many of this, this criticism fell mute when the Truman Doctrine was issued. Long before George W. Bush, it was Truman who said, you are either with us or against us. And you had McCarthyism and HUAC, and so one of the most dangerous things you could be was to be labeled black and red. And so groups like the NAACP took a sharp turn to the right. They made a decision to ally themselves with Truman in hopes of gaining civil rights, which doesn't pan out for them. But not all black activists looked at this pine period as in peace as a negotiating chip. Because at the same time, you had the outbreak of the Korean War. And there were many in the black community that said, we're not going to allow another Hiroshima to happen. We're not going to allow another people of color to get hit by nuclear weapons. We've got to stop this. And at the same time, there was a communist-led peace movement and the Stockholm Peace Pledge, the Ban the Bomb Pledge. And Du Bois and Robeson took that pledge, brought it to the United States, and started gaining signatures for it. Now, if I say that to students today, most of them say, big deal, because you can go on change.org today, be an armchair activist, you're one click away from signing your petition. But that wasn't the case back then. People like Charlie Parker and Marian Anderson and Duke Ellington, 2.5 million people in the US signed that petition. There were real consequences. People lost their jobs, they were physically beaten, they were arrested, they brought up charges on Du Bois of being an agent to the Soviet Union, found not guilty. Robeson's whole career was destroyed in many cases over all of this. So it's extraordinary that on the cusp of the civil rights movement, you had so many in the black community that were still fighting for nuclear disarmament. And in the early 50s and mid 50s, so many things were joining together that show you these connections. You know, in 54, we had Brown versus Board of Education desegregating schools. A year later, in the summer of 55, the heinous murder of Emmett Till. A few months later in December, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But people forget during that same year in 1955, you had the Bandung Conference, the first all African Asian conference of nations meeting together, and their platform was very clear. They were against colonialism, white supremacy, and nuclear disarmament. And many in the black community either attended or sent their regards. And at the same time, in the late 1950s, the French wanted to be a world power and announced they were gonna test their first nuclear weapon. Where? In Africa, in the Sahara. And Ghana was going through their independence movement with Nkrumah. Algeria was in the middle of their war. And so there was an activist in the United States that saw all this playing out and how people in Ghana worried about the nuclear fallout and what it would do to the cocoa industry and said, I got to put these all together. And it was Bayard Rustin, who so many of my students had never heard of because he was gay. And so we don't want to talk about him. We try to ice him out of the movement. And so Rustin puts together a team of activists, British, African, and what works with Nkrumah and he goes to Africa to try to stop the French test, physically putting his body on the line. And not everybody here wanted him to do that. A. Philip Randolph and others wanted him here organizing for the primaries of the presidential election. But here, Rustin is writing back saying, this is the most important work I can do. Don't you see how these things are all connected? Colonialism and racism and nuclear weapons. And the French end up testing their nuclear weapon, the military physically removing him and others. Um, but protests break out all over the continent. And Rustin still looked at it as a victory because Nkrumah followed it up with World Without the Bomb conferences and and other pieces to, to keep this issue on their radar. And of course, I can't talk about nuclear disarmament in the black community without mentioning Dr. King. Yeah. Um, people talk about Dr. King and they talk about foreign policy and many want to say that it was April 4th, 1967, his Beyond Vietnam speech, where he calls the United States, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, that that was the moment he got into the foreign policy issue. But actually, if you look at nuclear weapons, you'll realize it was 10 years before that. In 1957 is when King first came out and declared he was against nuclear weapons and they needed to be banned. And he consistently argued this, telling students at Spelman and telling black pastors, uh, what does it matter if we're trying to integrate lunch counters and not be worried about the world in which we're trying to integrate? It makes no sense. And where was King learning all this from? His wife, of course. Coretta was a 
Long activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. She had been involved in Women's Strike for Peace, Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. Um, and so she was a seasoned activist who pushed him on this peace issue. And Coretta, like so many other black women, Lorraine Hansberry, who we now, everybody thinks of as Raising in the Sun, but she was a strong feminist, anti-nuclear activist who famously went to see a documentary of Hiroshima and came out and said, no more Hiroshima's not now, not ever. The last play Hansberry ever did was about a nuclear holocaust and what would happen to the survivors. And so for a lot of these black women that were at the forefront of this, one thing is they had to deal in these peace movements that were mostly predominantly white middle class women of an internal racism. That went on in the peace movement across the board. At Women's Strike for Peace, there was a, a, a national conference in which the black members wanted to carry signs that said desegregation or disintegration. And the white members said, absolutely not. We're not going to combine the issue of race and nuclear weapons. And it often took Coretta and others to kind of broker the deal to make sure um, that these things stayed front and center and were indeed connected. And this issue stays in the black community with Vietnam when, again, we threatened to use nuclear weapons multiple times on a people of color. Uh, it's there when you look at the Black Panther Party and the first statement the Black Panther Party ever read, executive mandate number one. They specifically talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and tie it to their community. And I asked Bobby Seale, co-founder of the party, was that intentional? He said, of course it was. We always looked at ourselves in an international context, which is why Eldridge and Kathleen Cleaver were asked to go to Japan and speak to atomic bomb survivors. And it stays there through the 1970s. Who was it that talked and advised Jimmy Carter not to build a neutron bomb? His UN ambassador, who was Andrew Young, Dr. King's right-hand man. It was Andy Young who was constantly talking about being more active in South Africa, especially when they were then building their secret nuclear weapons program with the help of Israel. And then, of course, this is all leading to the 1980s. Uh, in some ways, the, the zenith, if you will, of the, of the nuclear disarmament movement. Reagan comes in and increases military spending by $180 billion, slashes social spending by $140 billion, uh, announces he's going to build the MX missile, and a, and a movement just goes into a, a, another direction in terms of how, how fast and how much it was organizing. And you see it coming from all directions. You know, when I was writing this book, I was also writing for the Huffington Post, and I got a call from a gentleman. He said, I need to talk to you about, about your work. And uh, his name was Greg Johnson. And him and his wife, Linda, at the time, were, he was a librarian at Georgetown, African-American, ordinary citizens. And they were so deeply interested in this issue. But when they reached out to the white anti-nuclear groups, mostly white groups, they said, the black community doesn't care about this. We're not going to go into your community. And so they said, the hell with it. We'll do it ourselves. And so with a rotary phone and one flyer, they started the group Blacks Against Nukes. Grew to hundreds of, of members in multiple chapters. They were featured in Ebony and Jet and Essence magazine, spoke in Hiroshima. Two ordinary people doing something extraordinary. And I'm so glad we have the more socially conscious athletes now, from Serena Williams to LeBron, uh, when we talk about socially conscious athletes, we often think of the 68 Olympics with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. We think of, of course, Muhammad Ali. But there were other athletes that were socially conscious, especially in the 80s. They were called Athletes United for Peace. Jojo Washington, who played for the Boston Celtics, and Marianne Washington, the first female uh, African-American Olympic runner. We had so many um, activists that were also athletes working with Russian athletes to try to stop this. And of course, all of this in the 1980s, the culmination was with the June 12, 1982 march, when over a million people gathered in Central Park, the largest march of anything in our country's history, uh, to ban nuclear weapons. And that march, again, some of these issues came up. But because of the Reverend Herbert Daughtry and the, United, the Black United Front and the Third World People's Coalition and Caucus, what ends up happening is because of people like Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee and Shaka Khan and Rita Marley, 50% of the leadership of that march were African-American. And on that beautiful day, you had thousands of African-Americans pouring out of Harlem and Bed-Stuy, all now marching for an end to nuclear weapons. Uh, certain President Barack Obama was a young reporter, actually, at that march. And as far as writing this book and kind of taking the chronology through the years of this, the hardest part for me was writing about President Obama. Um, in part because I was writing the book as he was still president. And the worst thing you want to do as a historian is predict something and then be wrong. But I knew I was going to have to address this. And the first thing to understand about Obama is the people that came before him in politics. Right? Um, people like Ron Dellums, who we lost not too long ago. 
The Congressional Black Caucus used to be at the forefront of this issue. It was Ron Dellums who challenged Reagan on the MX missile, who goes to Utah where it was supposed to be headquartered and convinces Spencer Kimball, the head of the Utah of the Mormon Church, to come out against building it there. Right? It was people like Jesse Jackson who ran for president in 84 and 88 and actually had the strongest anti-nuclear platform of any candidate. People like Harold Washington, who was one of Obama's heroes, the first black mayor uh, in Chicago, who won multiple awards for all his anti-nuclear efforts. And so Obama was against nuclear weapons as a student and as a candidate and as a senator. And when he gets in office, uh, he of course gives the Prague speech, arguably the most anti-nuclear speech any president has given outside of maybe John Kennedy's commencement address in June of 1963 at my alma mater, American University. And I used to go to Japan teaching Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer um, with American University. And I remember going back to Hiroshima the year after he gave the Prague speech. The mayor in Hiroshima started a campaign called the Obama Majority, in which people were wearing Obama Majority t-shirts in Hiroshima. Japanese citizens were asking me if I was American and then handing me stacks of letters and saying, send these to your president to thank him for what he's doing. It was the first time in my life of all the years going to Hiroshima that I was actually proud of who my president was um, and what we were doing. And Obama didn't stop there. He passed the New START Treaty. He had nuclear summits to get nuclear weapons materials in safe hands. If you think back, he got enough uh, material to build four nuclear weapons out of Ukraine just before it falls into chaos. Uh, the, the thing I think he did, which was the most important thing of his presidency, bar none, was the Iran deal without firing a shot and getting Iran to stop making a nuclear weapon. And on a personal note, because it was something I advocated for and certainly had nothing to do with, but constantly publicly advocated for, is, is him visiting Hiroshima. And I, I will never forget being up at three in the morning on Skype with Hiroshima survivors and crying, seeing my president in Hiroshima. Now, does that mean I was happy with everything Obama did? Of course not. He should have certainly got rid of more nuclear weapons, not signed on to the trillion dollar modernization. He should have taken him off hair trigger alert before he left office. Um, but I don't put that on Obama, I put that on us. Because he never said, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. And if we really wanted him or anybody else to do something, we have to push them. And if there were millions of people in the streets, he maybe would have acted. Anything that we've accomplished in this country, we've pushed for it, and that's how it's gotten accomplished. So, what now? What can we learn from this research? Well, I'll be honest with you. As somebody that's dedicated my entire life to eliminating nuclear weapons and eliminating racism and having a white supremacist with sole authority of our nuclear weapons in the White House right now, it's pretty easy for me to feel defeated. But I made a promise to the Habaksha that I would never stop fighting on this issue. And so I feel you gotta fight now more than ever in that regard. Uh, Trump has the power to, with 32 warheads to decimate North Korea, 90 for Iran, um, 147 for Russia. And so in that regard, we are really the only fail safe left. Um, in terms of connecting race to nuclear weapons, I don't think it's any clearer than you have right now. Trump and Putin have 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. Two white supremacist authoritarian leaders with 90% of the nuclear arsenal. And on the other side, as Ray will talk about, you have ICANN, you have over 100 nations, mostly non-white, saying they want to ban nuclear weapons. It can't be any starker. Here's our president who got the coveted Ku Klux Klan endorsement, who said he wants to resume nuclear testing. We know what that does to people of color. He says that Various countries should build their own nuclear arsenals, like Japan and South Korea. Um, he has said now that the Mideast, uh, Saudi Arabia and others, we should just destroy their whole families, terrorists. We should take out the Iran deal. And his economics plan has been called Reaganomics on steroids. And so my big thing is that to learn from those as a historian who came before us. You know, when I researched this book and I, and I saw that there were so many people before us who were in their own misery, who were in the abyss trying to fight for their own civil rights and their survival, and then managed to wield their collective power so that we could have a world free of nuclear weapons, it's extraordinary. I know that racism and nuclear weapons are still going to be here when I die. But to do this, we got to think beyond the present moment. Thinking beyond our generation, um, rather than surrendering in despair. 
That's what this activism is all about. You know, King said the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, but not unless we bend it. And so, yes, we have to make sure that our LGBTQ community is treated equally. We have to make sure that our undocumented immigrants are protected. We need to make sure that our climate change is addressed and we need to keep the silos on the farms and see how these things are connected. But as Dr. King said, what does it matter if we finally achieve social justice, if we surely and make sure that black lives do indeed matter if we're all dead from nuclear war? And so we start to connect these issues. We start to look at it like so many people in our past did. Then we'll start to understand that, as perhaps Malcolm X understood it best, the issue for us has never really been about civil rights. It is, was, and can always will be about universal human rights. Thank you.